and welcome to World Inside with Tianwei, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, Spain has fired Catalonia's governor and installed the deputy prime minister to take over the region in response to Catalonia's independence declaration. How can Spain impose direct rule over Catalonia without alienating its people? rise of the far-right nationalism in Europe and outright secessionist movements like in Catalonia have derailed the EU's motto of unity in diversity. I speak with former Slovenian president Danilo Turk to find out how Europe can remain united and many other issues as well. And let's begin our program in Spain, where Spain's deputy prime minister has been appointed to take over control of Catalonia. Meanwhile, Spain's chief prosecutor announces criminal charges against the Catalan leaders for breaching Spanish law. Today marks the first full working day for the Catalan region under the Spanish central government. Hundreds of thousands of pro-unity protesters took to the streets of Barcelona on Sunday in a show of support for Spain's central government. Take a look at this. As Catalonia's sacked leader Carlos Puigdemont called on the Catalan people to peacefully oppose Spain's takeover of the autonomous region, demonstrators took to the streets in Barcelona. Some carried the flag of Catalan in support of independence, while others waved the flag of Spain for unity. There could be clashes between the pro-unity people and the pro-independent people. It's a wait and see in the coming days. Outside of Catalan, some Spanish citizens rallied in support of a united Spain in the capital, Madrid. Here in the Spanish capital, a show of support for the prime minister, a big rally in favor of Spanish unity at a big plaza just up the street from where I'm standing. Madrid is pushing hard to keep the country united. So if they proclaim the Republic of Catalonia, but 24 hours afterwards, who has recognized the Republic of Catalonia? None. The government says recognition by the international community is crucial as the crisis is closely followed by the European Union. Europe has a very clear position. An interlocutor different from the Kingdom of Spain does not exist. Catalonia isn't the only region in Europe looking for independence. Experts say the EU is now facing a big challenge since many other regions are looking for further autonomy. Although Puigdemont has been fired, the region will remain unstable between now and the December election. For more on Catalan independence, which is Spain's biggest political crisis, some say in over 40 years, we now turn to our panelists in Beijing studio, Wang Yiwei, Jean Monnet Chair Professor and also Director of the Center for EU Studies at Renmin University here in Beijing. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Joining us in Barcelona, in Spain, Dr. Pablo Aguia, who is the research expert at the International Catalan Institute for Peace. Welcome. I'm sure you're very busy these days. In Brussels, we are joined by Nicholas White, senior director and head of services to government in APCO's Brussels office. Welcome as well. I want to start with you, Mr. Aguia, in Spain. What about the case filed by the federal prosecutor against the president or, let's just say, regional leader of Catalan? Um, secession, um, also some of the other charges. What would that mean? I think it will be probably not, not um, on political terms, not a big uh, development. I mean, it's something we already expected, that if, if a declaration of uh, independence unilaterally by the Catalan government would lead to uh, the president of Catalonia being charged for uh, sedition and rebellion. Mm. So that would lead him probably to prison, at least temporarily. Mm. Prison term could be as long as several decades, I was informed earlier by some of the legal scholars. But let's just move on from there to something even more important. The first day, Mr. Aguia, in the office for all the federal Sorry, workers. Sorry, can you repeat this? First day for all those working for the Catalan local government. It seems that everything quite smooth so mm. far. What does that say? about the momentum 
for so-called independence today, in the region. Today, in terms of public administration work, uh, the instructions received by the civil servants is to just paralyze every project and just uh, show uh, not opposition uh, to whether decisions taken by uh, people signaled by Madrid and on sent by Madrid. Hmm. Uh, so it seems to be, at least on the public administration work, is going to be slowed down very much, but it's not going to face a huge opposition to the decisions taken by the persons that is, is in charge sent by Madrid. Okay. Mr. White, your observation, two things. One, the referendum, of course, was done. Voted yes for independence locally in Catalonia. However, only 43% of people turned out. Secondly, you got 65 to 61, in a way, in the parliament voting in Catalonia, and yet in the General Assembly, shall we say, in Spain, the pro-independence parties are far from the majority party. So what does all of these numbers tell us also about the legality of this, uh, what we call, independence movement? Well, it's a very good question. In the first place, of course, the, this, uh, this uh, can often be a situation where the law has to catch up with what the political reality on the ground may be. Uh, I can think of very few uh, independence movements um, who started off from a position of legality from the country from where they were trying to secede. So in a sense we're not in a very unusual position from the historical context here. Um, that vote in the referendum, uh, as you rightly said, 43% of the electorate who turned out and 38% of the electorate who voted in favour. Um, someone pointed out to me the other day that that's actually a, a larger fraction of the electorate uh, than of the voters in the UK who voted for Brexit uh, because of the differential turnouts uh, to be considered there. It would be a jolly good vote for any ruling party in Europe uh, to get that, that percentage of the electorate as a whole or indeed of those who are voting. Uh, mm. So uh, sure it's not over 50% of all voters but it's still a, it's a significant voice that needs to be taken into account. Uh, and your final point is, of course, the crux of the issue. Uh, the fact is that we have to decide, uh, Catalans and Spaniards must decide who gets mm. to set the future of Catalonia. Is it the people who live there or the people who don't? Mm. Um, is, it, uh, is Catalonia able to decide its own future or can that only happen within a Spanish context? That is at the centre of the discussion that we've been having. And that goes back, let's not forget, to the disputes over the autonomy of Catalonia that have been happening for the last 10 years, which have been pretty much one of the drivers of the situation. Mm. Mr. Aguilla, I heard uh, that you want to say something to your colleagues as well, to interact about that, some of the point you just made. Uh, Mr. Aguilla, you want to say something? Yeah, what, what he said, uh, I agree completely. The last 10 years have shown a uh, uh, decline in autonomy in Catalonia, and there was a, a, a wish of most of the population to decide whether they wanted to continue to be with Spain or not. Mm. And uh, the government of Spain didn't accept at all, not the referendum in Catalonia, but not even a referendum in the whole of Spain, asking about this issue. And that, I think, is the lesson we have to try to read from this, this process. Uh, whenever people demand ballot boxes to take a decision collectively, uh, they should be heard. Mm. But one of the things I might disagree a bit with Mr. White about the numbers, for example, the German parliamentary election, or as we have witnessed recently, got 70% of voter turnout. And that is just average for German elections. So it's not in every European country the election turnout is as low as 40% as you just early Ooh. illustrated. Uh, Maybe the UK uh, is the case. But I'm sorry, I may have... Go ahead. I may have expressed myself badly. I, I meant the percentage of the electorate as a whole who vote for the winning side. I see. And I think if you look at the German parliamentary election, I think you'll find that the, uh, indeed, a 70% turnout but only a 36% vote for Chancellor Merkel's party. Mm -hmm. uh, by my money, that's roughly a 25% of the total electorate who voted points. for her party, and yet we call them the winners. Mm. Points made clearly. Thank you, sir. And let me go to you, Professor Wang Yiwei, here in Beijing. 
There are several things that is going on. One is the history between Catalonia as a region of Spain and Spain itself. Because we know there was something earlier, even a hundred years ago, and most recently with some of the Franco administration and the history developed from there. Secondly, is what would Catalonia mean for all the other places in Europe that also have so-called thoughts of independence? Um, Mr. Wang, would you like to help us understand better about that from a Chinese perspective? Well, I think firstly, uh, Catalonia seems to be in the 17th century is quite dependent. They have their own language, they have their own political system, mm -hmm. so it's not so united uh, like China. Uh, you know, since the first emperor of the Qin Shi Huang to, to 1 BC, that's a different case. Uh, it's a very rich era uh, since the Rome Empire because it's a uh, cousin era of the Mediterranean Sea, yeah. and then uh, so that the two driving forces of the gap between the rich and the poor and the ideology, cultural, uh, they have some uh, gaps also. And then recently, uh, because of the uh, European uh, leaders like the French, French President, German Chancellor, pushed forward so called the uh, uh, fiscal policy united there because that's the reason of their debt crisis. So, Catalonians, pe uh, the, the people, they're very worried about that. They mm. were, uh, substitute of many uh, to other places of their Spain, they then see independence. But uh, France, they also worry about that because actually there are more than 100,000 uh, uh, Catalonians also live in, uh, in France. Mm. So if, if they are independent, they are, th those people also moved back to uh, Spain, uh, to uh, Catalonia. So it's also a problem. Of course, the other countries also suffer similar uh, separatist or independence movement, like, uh, you know, uh, Corsica in France and uh, Italy Northern and all the north and, and uh, Belgium and even uh, people have seen mentioned about uh, uh, Buffalo in Germany but there is a federal system but much better than that. So abuse of the, uh, of the referenda and also uh, abuse of the rights, human rights and uh, uh, too much freedom and, uh, and that makes excuse for the politicians as a populist movement and then in the name of the independence so that's uh, I think the European are uh, very worried about that. Mm. Well, there are several cases that you have seen, Mr. White, in Europe, for example, about small regions or even bigger regions trying to seek a different voice of independence compared to the country in which they are being officially recognized. For example, in Flanders region of Belgium, in northern Italy, in Corsica of France, and in some of the other places as well. Will Catalonian crisis serve as a precedence for the other places? Whether it is about the central government's interaction with the region, or it's about regional's own decision, or the national constitution vis-a-vis -vis regional legal decision, in any of these cases, will the Catalonian crisis serve as a precedence? Will it serve as a good example, or will it serve as a totally bad and negative example? This is an interesting and very thought-provoking question. Mr. White. Um, absolutely, and in fact, I come from Belfast in Northern Ireland, where we have been dealing with these issues and similar issues uh, for a very long time. Um, it seems to me that, first of all, every situation is different, mm. and so there is, there is no precedent that fits every other case. But the crucial thing that has gone wrong in the Catalan case is the treatment of the, of the situation by the central government. Uh, and you mentioned Flanders, and you mentioned Northern Italy, and you mentioned Corsica, and we could add Scotland to that, and we could add a few others, I'm mm. sure. But in all of these cases, the, the, the problem has remained being treated in a political, legal, and democratic way. And unfortunately, the, the avenue to approach that um, indeed to go for the ballot boxes rather than to resolve the, the situation by other means. I see. Um, that was denied in the Catalan case by the Spanish government and I think that proves to be a mistake. Once you say to people that this cannot be discussed politically, unfortunately you leave open the possibility that it gets discussed in other ways. Mm. Mr. Aguilla certainly has, has his, uh, his views as well. Mr. Aguilla, I want to ask you about that too because now we also see mm -hmm. a timeline not just a debate about the question itself, but a timeline about an election being called upon in Catalonia in December. So from now until then, 
there seems to be a lot of political parties fighting for the voices, for the seats, for the parliament, and eventually for probably the regional office. What do you see is going to happen? Uh, will people's voices becoming more regional and rational, or political parties will, you know, take advantage of the crisis and elaborate it, no matter in which direction, to the extreme? What's likely to happen, Mr. Akia? Well, it, it's really difficult to foresee what is going to happen, but I think the political move made by Rajoy calling on elections on the 21st of December was really a good one because it made uh, appear doubts to the independent political parties whether to present candidacies to these uh, elections or not. Or to do it uh, unified as they did on the last elections in which they were able to uh, accomplish an overall majority or if they will do separately that will lead them to be less hopeful of reaching this overall majority. So that is really a good move. What would happen? Uh, we have different scenarios here. Probably uh, on the Catalan independency political party's option would be uh, big repression from Madrid on the application of 155 articles. That means uh, resigning most of the people being in the administration on the, on the higher levels. Mm. And that could lead to uh, demonstrations. Uh, if these demonstrations are not taken uh, peacefully in, uh, from the Spanish police, that could lead to a very emotional vote on the 21st of December in favor of independence. Mm. But what about the on locals? On the other side... Yeah. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, tell me. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. On the other side, uh, Madrid mm, wish would be to have a smooth uh, transition to this 21st of December and then being able to uh, beat the independency parties, political parties, on the, mm, on the elections. If mm. that happens, would be a very serious uh, smash on the options of independence of Catalonia. Mm. At this point, we understand the parliament uh, speaker is now in the office uh, for the regional office right now, taking the place of so-called regional leader, or even called uh, earlier as so-called president. But uh, that is uh, still a long way to go politically, even though only two months, uh, but a lot of things could happen. Having said that, a poll published recently by the Spanish national newspaper El Parrot has on Saturday suggested that 55% of the Catalan respondents opposed to the Declaration of Independence, 41% in favor, as we have suggested earlier. But there were also earlier suggestions that if a election being held right now, those that are supporting independence, those political parties, will not, at this point at least, win the election that is has been confirmed uh, a survey by some of the other organizations so how you said that though professor wong how should we look at this i mean this seems to be a crisis about independence uh, from spain and the history behind it and there are complicated background but a lot of things has to do with the immigrants that are coming into spain with the different kinds of wealth divide and gap in different regions of spain uh, with the fact that some regions are having momentum for growth, uh, for example, Catalonia, very well off compared to the other regions, and yet others are not that way, and the Catalonians feel, why should we share? So this has a lot to do with the bigger picture. With that picture in mind, the Professor Wang, what kind of thing can we perceive from here? I would also like to have the others to respond to that after you. Professor Wang, you go first. Yes, so it's a uh, comprehensive reading, it's not just a one single reason, actually. Uh, the European countries suffer many crises, um, debt crisis, you know, refugee crises, and uh, so that's the kind of the result, and the populist and nationalists also going up in many countries, not just in Spain, and uh, uh, the European Union now is very difficult to keep so-called the motto of the uh, unity in diversity, because uh, uh, in the former time, they focus more on the diversity, focus on the competition, and now I think they pay more attention to their unity because of their migrants and then it's too diverse for the, mm. for the society, uh, particularly for Spain because occupied by uh, the Arabic uh, 800 years in history so 
uh, the, uh, uh, facing so many the refugees from the Middle East and uh, uh, Western Africa. And so many countries are very worried about not just the, the tech of the jobs, but also cause on social problems. The identity crisis is the most right. serious challenge for every country. For instance, that the uh, opposition party leader of the uh, uh, in this, uh, Catalonia said, we are, uh, 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 Catalonia is our hometown, uh, Spain is our nation, but uh, Europe is our future. I think that's the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the consensus, the majority of the consensus. Right. But still some of the uh, separatist, uh, populists in the name of the bandits uh, make, the, make their voice to be heard and then get some power and bargain with the government. All right. We only have 40 seconds left for the other two panelists. So 20 seconds for each of you. What are some of the most important barometers you would suggest that we need to watch from now until the election? Let's go to Mr. Akia first. Well, first of all, is to see how this application of, of the uh, rejection of the political leaders of Catalonia is taken by the civil society, if it's going to be on smooth, peaceful, probably, uh, demonstrations. Mm -hmm. But to, to what extent that is going to be a challenge for a Spanish government? I see. I think the most important thing right now. Mr. White, final words. Don't, don't trust the opinion polls. Look at whether or not Madrid is able to, to, to regain the trust of all of the people of Catalonia in its ability to del deliver government services right. the, that they want and for which Madrid is responsible. Well, I guess Europe is watching. The rest of the world is too. So thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us at this point. Professor Wang Yiwei, Dr. Pablo Aguilla, Mr. Nicholas White. Really appreciate it, gentlemen, for being thank with you. us. And you are watching World Inside with Tianwei, still to come on our program. The fragmentation of Europe from Brexit to Catalonia's seeking independence has derailed the EU's motto, unity in diversity. I speak with former Slovenian president, Danilo Turk, to find out how Europe can get back on track, together with some of the other issues as well. This is World Inside on CGTN, and I'm Tianwei. We are seeing a rise in far-right and closed-door policies in Europe. Although Merkel is still in charge of Germany and pro-EU Macron won the French presidential election, Germany's far-right AFD and France National Front both made history in their respective votes. And the outside world is wondering if Britain's departure from the EU would herald a closed Britain. Theresa May insists that Britain is willing to do business with anyone but declaring a nation open for business, then closing the doors to foreigners is contradictory. And most recently, the Catalan political crisis has gripped the world's attention. Now Madrid has stripped autonomy of Catalonia and threatened to jail its leader, while both supporters and opponents of independence pure into the streets. So exactly what is happening in Europe and probably beyond, the recently I sat down with Danilo Turk, the former president of Slovenia and also who served as Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, discussing those critical issues in his region and in his country. What about the issue of so-called Catalonia independence? This has been in the press so much recently yeah. on the headlines. What is your views about the interactions between Catalonia, the local, and also the Spanish government? I think that there, there has been a lot of unwise policy involved in the recent weeks because the referendum uh, showed that you know, a rather small number of people came. In other words, Catalonia remains very seriously divided. Mm. And the question is whether the will of the people of Catalonia is really in favor of independence. This is not as clear as one would assume mm. because the people of that uh, region are really divided. But, but the parliament uh, voted yes. The parliament voted yes, sure. But that didn't take care of the problem because independence has to be supported by a very strong majority of everybody mm. in the country. And that has not been done. 
What would this mean? I mean, the Catalonia issue, is it going to set a precedence? Among many of the other cases, similar cases in different European countries, as you may know, Mr. President, yes. the European history is very complicated, just as history anywhere else in the world. So issues like that might pop up from time to time. So what kinds of precedents do you think this will set and should set? Well, I think that the precedent of this cannot be set because uh, this is a whole series, there is a whole series of specific uh, circumstances that characterize the development in Catalonia. Mm. But there is one fundamental thing which I would really like to emphasize and that is that in normal circumstances uh, people will think very seriously before opting for independence as opposed to national unity. Uh, in normal circumstances uh, we would see more like uh, Scotland mm. uh, where there was a referendum but on the whole people realized that it is better to preserve the kind of normalcy they had. That's right. There was no police force involved, there was no um, uh, drama involved of that kind uh, but the people simply uh, came to a rational conclusion. I think one has to respect the ability of people to come to rational conclusions. Mm -hmm. One should not try to prevent people from expressing their opinions. That, I think, is fundamental. But you see, Mr. President, in every European country, it seems these days, have their own set of problems. This time, only bigger than it used to be. Uh, so how do you see these different sets of crises in different capitals that are dragging the European countries away from rallying themselves to come up with some specific solutions to the continent? Well, I think that European Union will have to sit down and uh, ser seriously think about its future in the coming period. Uh, now, of course, right now, practically speaking, we are waiting for the German government to be formed. As you know, Germany has The coalition elections. government. Yes, and the coalition government will have to define its approach. And I hope that approach will follow something that was demonstrated by the new president of France mm. a few weeks ago when he came with a specific proposal for strengthening of the European Union policies. I believe that that represents about 70% of answers to your question. Not all answers, but 70%. Yeah. When it comes to the question of um, coherence of nation states or states members of the European Union, we need more wisdom than we currently have. Mm. And uh, I am not sure how that will go. Um, I think that uh, both values, uh, the will of the people and the integrity of states have to be preserved. Well, the European Union could put its strategies together, but the country members or the member countries have also to do their job because the European Union is not just entity. Well, the European Union is a little bit like a human being. It has <clears throat> two legs. One leg is member states, the other leg is European institutions. Mm -hmm. And like any human being, uh, when one leg suffers, sooner or later the other leg suffers also. So right now we, have, we see suffering in the nation states of Europe, uh, in not all, but right. most. But then uh, the institutions become more limited in their capacity. What we now need is a kind of generation of political will at the European level, through the European institutions, mm. that would define the projection for the future better. You see also the debate within the European Union about so-called old Europe yes. and the new Europe. Uh, what do you make as Slovenia? a so-called one of those from the new Europe. Yes. What about the prospect that you are facing right now? Well, first of all, we in Slovenia don't like this idea of new Europe vis-a-vis -vis old Europe. Now, of course, this division between old and new Europe is artificial and I think is very disturbing because that uh, smacks of the old times of mm -hmm. Cold War when we had two types of Europe and permanent divisions of Europe are always a danger. Mm -hmm. So we are not uh, happy to see that these divisions are re-emerging again. Where are the solutions? I believe that the European Union will have to redefine its concept of solidarity. And everybody should participate in defining it. Well, you know, initially much of that solidarity was expressed in the so-called common agricultural policy. Mm -hmm. But we need more than that. We need solidarity which is much deeper and much more comprehensive. Many of the Central and Eastern European countries are very active on the international stage these days, more and more. For example, 
some of you have established the so-called 16 plus 1 mechanism, yeah. Central and Eastern European countries with China, for example. How would that work, and how is that going to serve your mission for the future vis-à-vis, -vis, let's just say, the European Union as a whole? We see this as a part of a long-term process of transformation. We see China as a partner who will be with us for the rest of history. Mm. We don't see China as an accidental visitor. China is with us for the rest of history. So we have to work with China. Secondly, Central and Eastern Europe is a part of Europe which needs more attention in terms of development of infrastructure, foreign investment, technological improvement, mm. use of logistic potential, and everything else. Yeah. So we see China as a very natural partner for Central and Eastern Europe in this kind of domains. And we, I must emphasize, we do not see any contradiction between a slightly higher attention that we have uh, in this context of 16 plus 1 vis-a-vis mm. -vis the rest. The former president of Slovenia, Danilo Turk, is not only a president of his country, but also an expert for long in global governance. Turk served as Slovenia's first ambassador to the UN from the year 1992. Then in 2000, he was appointed by Kofi Annan, then Secretary General of the United Nations, as the Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs. Then he witnessed the ups and downs of the Korean nuclear crisis and the Sixth Party talks. In 2005, Turk returned to Slovenia and became a professor of international law. 2007, he was elected as Slovenia's third president and served a five-year term. And in the year 2016, he was a contender in the UN Secretary General election. Take a look at what he has to say about some of the other crucial issues around the world. Uh, there has been a lot of debate about Northeast Asia security situation. Yes. You once served as the Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations. You also campaigned as a candidate for the yes. Secretary General. You know very well about that because you were in charge of yes. that issue when you were serving for the sure. UN. But that was during the time of the six-party talks. Yeah, sure. It was the sunshine policy. Sunshine policy. Yes, yeah. but now we don't see much sunshine. No. We see a lot of crisis. Yes. So, Mr. President, what do you think as a long-time observer of this, yes. participant as well, and also someone from outside those, let's just say, stakeholders, yes. of this process we witnessed over the past 15 years? Well, this is a very unfortunate turn of events because you are very right when you reminded me of the good old days of the sunshine policy. Just imagine President Kim Den Jung visiting President, President Kim Song Il, uh, uh, you know, and having discussions. At that time in the United Nations, we were thinking about a kind of a regional system for Northeast Asia security cooperation. It looked very realistic. You were exactly working on that. Yes, exactly. We were working on that. We saw six party talks. As, a, as an embryonic form of a stable Northeast Asian security system. There are two things which I believe are important here. First, uh, I believe that it is essential to establish the right kind of dialogue between North Korea and the United States. We know that that dialogue continues, that it's uh, more or less confidential, mm. but it has to continue and has to continue with persistence. The second, more long-term vision is still related to this Northeast Asian security system right. idea. Because at one point, we'll have to come back to six-party talks. I don't think that a permanent solution... Or multiple-party talks. Or multiple-party talks, sure. I don't think that a permanent solution of the Korean issue without such a broader framework, multilateral framework, mm. would be possible. We are nowhere near that, of course. We had to delay this project for yeah. I don't know how many years. But sooner or later, we'll come back to it. But you know, Mr. President, people say this is urgent. We have to rush because you got DPRK already developing quite a level of yes. uh, the nuclear power. And the experiments, as you have seen over the past few months, has been really going somewhere. So it is urgent. But on the other hand, we don't have much tools, yes. it seems. So how should we understand this you know, very apparent crisis that is just looming and coming toward our face? I don't think that 
uh, emphasizing the urgency of the problem helps resolving the problem. Mm. The problem is, of course, urgent, but we are not helping if the uh, element of urgency is continuously uh, emphasized. Mm -hmm. I think what we need to emphasize is the qualities that need to be put in place, qualities of dialogue, qualities of reduction of tensions, mm -hmm. and specific proposals that go in that direction are vitally important mm. in this context. And you know, I believe that um, the uh, pressure that has been built uh, so far is already quite high. Mm. Let, let us uh, stop for a moment and think about what other things have to be put into the picture in addition to pressure which has put uh, North Korea really in a rather difficult situation. So many challenges facing our world today. I wouldn't name all of them, but to you, someone who served as the president of a European country, as the Assistant Secretary General of the UN, a candidate for the Secretary General also. Sure. What do you consider will be the biggest one for you? Well, an American politician, a great political leader, Tip O'Neill, once explained that all politics is local. Now, in my opinion, uh, in our world today, all politics has become much too local. It is normal that politics is local because politics has to think about the life of people. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't become too local in the sense that people start believing that solutions of their problems are only at home or that they should take care only of their immediate concerns and forget about the larger picture. Mm -hmm. Now we see many manifestations of this problem. I mean, including the rise of far right in Europe, for example, in the region where I come from, where people believe that by closing their societies and returning to the outdated concepts of the past is the way towards future. Mm. Uh, I think that the politics today has become too local and it has to open up. And that is, uh, I think, the way forward. But not many politicians dare to say that, no. particularly when they are facing elections. Correct. And this is one of the problems. We have elections very frequently. Sometimes the elections are uh, called on early, so we have early elections. And this has developed a kind of political climate which is not conducive to the solution of the global problems of the world. Mm. Luckily, some of the key strategic uh, priorities of the world are sufficiently well understood by everybody, like, for example, climate change. That right. has now become generally understood, and people would not mind doing more to reduce greenhouse gases or to contribute to policies that are constantly you know, focusing on fighting the climate mm. change. But you know, this political cycle yes. coincides with your system, which, uh, which is being preached as democracy. So there are advantages of that. And there are possibly, as you illustrated, disadvantages of that as well. How do you see this balance? Well, there is a problem today because the electoral cycles uh, make the long-term planning very difficult. Mm. Uh, democracies of the Western type uh, do not have the capacity to plan in a very long-term sense. It was interesting to listen to talk of the 19th Congress of CPC, which spoke about democracy. So uh, I think that the democracies will have to be, in a way, revised. They would have to look into the capacity of long-term visions mm. and change things. Mr. President, before we go, I do have an ultimate question to ask you. Yeah, with your political wisdom and certainly with your rich experiences, both serving your country and on the regional and international stage, what this period of crisis, confusion, conflicts, possible confrontation would mean to us. You know, in Europe we have commemorated the 100th anniversary of World War I yes. recently. And as you know, there was a lot of discussion of how European powers of that era allowed themselves to sleepwalk into a war. But I think that this, this kind of sleepwalking is much less likely today that the world has reached nevertheless, irrespective of all the complications that we see and all problems that are uh, accompanying us. My hope would be that a grouping like G20 would play a role which would be very stabilizing in the world. 
course, G20 is publicly perceived um, only because of economics and such things. But the fact that the key players of the world are meeting regularly right. every year and they are discussing really very uh, sophisticated matters of global cooperation, that gives me a sense of reassurance. You know, after all, the world has progressed. Mm -hmm. We are not in a danger of sleepwalking into war. Wars can be prevented, and therefore I believe that the kind of dialogue which we have seen in the G20 context will help. We hope we will not sleepwalk into any crisis. <laughs> and by the way, all the mechanisms that you mentioned and the willingness to keep peace will always be with us. Well, this is not only a hope, this is my belief and expectation. It must happen. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for my being pleasure. with us. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank my you. pleasure. Okay. That is our exclusive interview with a former Slovenian president talking about the crisis in Europe and certainly some of the other hotspot issues around the world. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Insight CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Insight team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.